And uh, we, uh, we actually also, just lastly, I'll just say that we're pretty excited about a, um, started working with the team from USC. So some of the brightest minds in, uh, in biology, including Mars came up a couple of times, and one of the professors is actually an advisor to that mission to Mars. So it was nice to be working with someone in that space. And, uh, and, and including this, the second PhD in aquaponics in the US. So guys, you guys know how many PhDs in aquaponics there are? Well, right now, as far as I know, there's one. And the first one is right up there. That's Nate's story. So. <laughs> and two in the world that I'm aware of. So there's plenty of room to do research in, in this space that we practice. So I'll just start with Nate. Nate is the, the first PhD in aquaponics in the US. Um, he probably spent 10 years developing a product that's called the ZipGrow Tower with Bright Agrotech. And I know a number of you are using those products currently. It's a different definition of vertical farming, but it's definitely a definition that's not uh, theoretical, but it's actually in use. Uh, it's a, using a grow tower system for both hydroponics and aquaponics. And um, Matt, my best guess is that he's a, a serial entrepreneur. Uh, he's he's uh, has experience. Uh, he's a computer scientist with uh, work in mobile and um, mobile. What was the other character? Mobile and uh, I've, I've definitely been around the block. Okay, um. so he's been around the block, <laughs> and uh, at least one of his companies that he's launched was actually acquired by by a public company, um, and and he's based in Atlanta. Uh, so Michael is uh, he's the founder of Village Farms. Uh, he's been, it's, you know, I'm always interested in people's backgrounds, and he came to this th through the military, actually. Uh, he was a U.S. Navy officer and a pilot commanding a squadron um, with several tours overseas. His background is in aeronautical science and aviation management, and he was the founder since its inception of Village Farms. They have 220 acres of greenhouse glass. By my best guess, it's about 100 million pounds of tomatoes they're producing. And back of the napkin estimate, it's about 6% of the indoor greenhouse tomato market of North America. And he's based in BC, but he has operations in Texas as well as Dominican Republic. And the original vision that I had for this panel was there was sort of three different scaled operations. I was going to call it small, medium, and large, but now it's sort of taken a different twist. And I wanted to um, be begin to assess what this industry that we're talking about, whether regardless if it's aquaponic or hydroponic, but the concept of indoor agriculture, we have th distinctly different scales. And I want to know if, from each of you is can you comment on what you see as the future of our culture, given that you're all operating at such distinctly different levels? Um, well, from, from my perspective, uh, I definitely have a biased opinion. I, I believe in local everywhere. And, and so from my perspective, I think that uh, controlled environment or indoor-based growing is, is the future of uh, food. Um, in the United States, certainly, and if not, most of the world. Uh, so I think um, we're going to see um, very large-scale indoor ag um, take over many of the uh, crops that make sense to do that versus field-grown that are, you know, transported all over the country. So I, I think when you look at just the sheer scale of the major uh, markets, um, we're going to have to have a very big indoor uh, growing um, um, systems uh, and companies in order to support that. Uh, we're, we're in Atlanta, for example. We focus on salad mix. About $200 billion of salad mix is sold in the Atlanta area every year. Um, think about uh, the, the size of an operation you would have to have just to get 10% market share. And that's one city that's not even a big city. So I, I think it's going to be huge. Am I on? I am on. Okay, great. Um, so I think this industry is poised for a lot of growth. And um, I think specifically in kind of the small farmer to medium-sized farmer category. And one of the reasons for that 
is that um, you know most of the stuff coming off the shelf is coming from really large operations. So it's it's kind of this interesting thing. Once you get big, it's easy to get bigger, but it's a lot harder to get smaller. And um, kind of the distribution chains, uh, the way they operate right now, um, it's tough to smash those things apart, and you lose a lot of profitability once you've got this big chain distributing long distances. It's hard to smash that apart and sell your product and stay profitable um, and market to, on a local level to specialty and niche markets. So um, kind of where my organization and my farmers are focused is primarily on those smaller farms and figuring out how we take that low-hanging fruit. You know, how do we get in? How do we take those um, smaller markets? How do we take those uh, really high-margin products, start there, and then scale into our local market? So I really see a lot of growth there, um, and I don't see it displacing field agriculture. I come from traditional eggs. So I'll tell you, that's, that ain't going to happen. But um, it will form a really valuable part of the food supply chain, and especially for high-margin crops, you know, greens, herbs, um, things that are easier to cultivate in, indoors for sure. Well, I guess in my tenure, I, I've seen the uh, whole indoor greenhouse uh, segment go sort of from uh, – out of space to the fringes on the radar screen today. I mean, it's clearly here and it's growing. And I do see uh, potential for continued growth. Uh, you know, defining what a larger scale is and how long it takes is another thing because it's still farming and there are uh, peaks and valleys and cycles. Uh, uh, there's got to be a clear demonstration of profitability to get the capital. And uh, you know, so there's a lot of differences that you have to consider where you build, what's the environment, what's the cost of technology. But at the end of the day is where are you going to get the financing capital? And, uh, you know, we'll talk about that because uh, that's going to, without a proven track record, uh, uh, it's not necessarily going to explode tomorrow. That's my view. Cover, you covered a number of the questions we're going to talk about. So do you, do you want to expand a little bit on capital just for a minute since you brought it up? Well, I know, uh, you know, looking at my experience, I mean, I started 25 years ago, and we have now almost about 260 acres on the glass, and I've seen a lot of changes in the technology. I mean, today, when we do a development, we're looking at upwards of 1.5 million per acre. So we just built a very high-tech greenhouse two years ago in Texas, and it was a $42 million investment for 30 acres. Uh, that took 25 years to get to because... You know, the experiences that you have to be careful of in getting capital is what I consider capital punishment. You know, you don't have the capital, you get punished. And uh, and those punishers are commercial banks, you know, honestly, private equity and uh, venture. So you have to decide what kind of business model you really want. Do you want to, you know, is it about passion? Is it about making a living yourself? Is it about, you know, are your investments based on, uh, return on investment or just having a job or, you know, having jeans in your, you know, cash in your jeans, as they say, because that's going to be the key to growth is where does that financing come from? And uh, um, so, yeah, that's, I think at the end of the day, you have to get your arms around that. Well, I know there's a number of people in this room who want to eventually achieve the scale that you're at. So I'm wondering if there's a chance they can sort of ride your coattails. Piggyback on your success and the, their proven technology, and is there room for you to, uh, for you know, competitors to come into that space and still uh, not interfere too much with your market share? Yeah, absolutely. I think there really is uh, a lot of opportunity. It's, uh, you know, I've learned perseverance is probably the number one virtue in this business. I mean. In some ways, I'm not proud of it. In some ways, I am that I was in workout twice in my career in this industry, workout with a commercial bank, which you know, if you ever want to read a great book called The Man in Full, talks about workout bankers. And you learn a lot from that. You know, I failed twice in it, so each time it's a huge learning curve. But uh, I think uh, the earlier session, someone had mentioned, you know, pick your partners wisely, and that, I think that's tremendous advice. Uh, but you have to understand where that fine. I keep coming back to the financing because if it's a commercial bank, you're not going to have a lot of runway when things go bad. Uh, so you know, 
the farm credit system. I would advise anybody looking at this industry is to work with the farm credit system. You know, in the United States or in Canada, both countries have the farm credit system. It's a great institution. It is a bank, but it's a bank that's established. It's quasi-government-owned. Uh, they have a charter to support uh, agriculture. Uh, originally, it was rural agriculture or power companies, but I'm sure it work in their cities as well or wherever you want to do it. And that's, uh, you know, they're there for you because there are, uh, it's still farming. At the end of the day, you know, we often say, and we're a publicly traded company today, so I have a board of directors, and at the end of the day, it's still farming and things can happen, and you need the financial institutions behind you that will support that. So pick that wisely. All right. I think we kind of touched on it a little bit, but I want to come back to it again. This, does size matter in order to achieve profitability? Uh, it depends on a lot of factors. Um, but I think that you have to, as a business, pick what size you want to be. And uh, if you want to be a small farm, you can be profitable small farm. If you want to be a large farm, you're not going to be profitable when you're small. Um, so you sort of need to figure out what you want to be when you grow up and uh, have the associated capital and um, scale uh, to achieve that. I think markets are what determine how whether you're going to be profitable. Size, you know, the size of your organization needs to fit the market and the, the, both the, the crop types that you select and um, kind of the volumes that you choose to produce that's what impacts your profitability. So, you know, I deal with a lot of farmers, um, a lot of startup farmers, and one of the first hard conversations that I have with them is, how big is your market? And we start with population. How many people are in your area? What are the values? You know, if you're in the Midwest, I'll tell you a lot of places in the Midwest, if you're in Omaha, um, your average person doesn't care that much about local, doesn't care that much about organic. So, you know, you have to have uh, your finger on the pulse of your community. You have to have your finger on the pulse of their values and the cultural values of your area. And uh, once you know that, you wa start walking into grocery stores and you start talking with produce managers and saying, hey, you know, how much do you sell this product? What do you sell it for? What are you getting it for wholesale? What are your seasonal variations in price? And you start just going through all the nuts and bolts of what those products look like. What are, what are, those, what are the margins that they expect? And what do you think you can produce them for? So inevitably, once you start doing that process, it's just it's market research, right? Once you go through all that market research, it's going to tell you how big you can grow. It's going to tell you how big your organization can be. And, um, you know, like with our farmers, we always advocate starting small. We always start um, and, and we focus on developing the equipment that will allow one person to do an awful lot of work. Um, and then sizing, growing organically, scaling into the market appropriately. Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes people can make as a beginning farmer is going big right off the bat. And uh, this, this is rough for me because I sell equipment, right? So <laughs> I have to talk to people and say, hey, you know, chop this order in half and, and you're talking something that's going to be um, a better fit for you. So once you, you know, once you've started as a farmer, you know, your scale is determined by your market. You can grow as big as your market. You ain't grown any bigger. So, um, Unless, of course, you're going to start multiple locations. So, I mean, this is something that we've had to do as an organization. We've, we've had to start more farms in other towns and scale kind of on this very um, distributed in a, in a, as a network, basically, as opposed to a central production facility. So, I mean, profitability, it's, it's a huge question. You know, it's, it's a really big question. It's really tough to answer without understanding your market very specifically. And uh, once you do, once you understand your margins, your production costs, you can figure out how big you can be. And um, bigger is not always better. I'll be the first to say that. <laughs> more money, more problems, right? I mean, the, the bigger you get, um, the less farming you do. So if you love farming, don't become a big organization because you're not going to be farming for long. Um, so it's kind of, it's a big question. It's, it's too much. There's guys over here laughing because they know exactly how that works. Um, so, you know, big question, but the answer is, Pretty darn complicated. Did you want to take it too? Sure. I mean, I can just go on my own experiences, but I would say you can because there's a million businesses that start small in many different business segments. And clearly, you know, I started small, so I'm here today. But, 
Yeah, I think uh, so. Yeah, the answer is you can start small, but what's going to get you at the end of the day? In fact, you know, I'd be more worried. I often look at it. I'd be more worried in the middle area, in the gray area, because if uh, and taken, and I agree with what you're saying, and you have to be careful when you do make that that uh, decision to go big. And it's sort of like that gray area. If you have a small, medium, and large business, however that's defined, it's the middle that scares me and has scared me the most. Because if you're small, things change, and you're in control, and you know you're the grower, you're the accountant, you're the janitor. You can hunker down, do whatever is necessary to get through the day. Uh, and if you're large, uh, although there's many problems, but you have a lot more people, resources, and uh, almost too big to fail in a way. And to get to that point, you've learned a lot. And key thing is having runway and reserve uh, because things change. But when you're in the middle, that area is tough because when things change, it's tough to downsize to small, and it's it's impossible to get big at that point. So. Uh, yeah, I think it can't be done, but you, you have to have the resources and uh, you have to know what you're doing. You have to think about your steps of growth because the one of the funny uh, problems for me coming from mostly high-tech businesses where um, we can create more of what we sell instantly, um, when you're growing stuff, it takes time. Um, and so if you're going to build a new facility to grow something, that's going to take a certain amount of time and capital. And then once you start growing it, it's going to take a certain amount of time before you can sell it. And so if you find yourself where you're selling everything that you're producing, you're pretty happy, but now you want to grow some more, you know, however long it took you to build that or however long it's going to take you to build their next thing and all the time it takes to get to your next crop is going to be sort of a heartache because your customers don't want to hear how you get your product. They just want more of it. Um, so you've got to be prepared to figure out how to make those steps right-sized uh, so that they're not too large. Because, you know, I, I mean, I've seen businesses that spent two years building out uh, greenhouses. Um, you know, what do they do when they sell out that greenhouse? Are they going to spend another two years to the next step? I mean, are the customers going to wait for two years for some more product from you? How do you get that, those steps along the way right-sized so that you can grow if that's what you want to do? Um, Michael, you said you started small. I'm curious. I'm not sure if that man's through Village Farms or in a previous life, but I'd like to know. It's really two parts. Like, what, what, how you define small, but, but also uh, specifically, what are the startup costs that took you and all of you to get to the point where you achieved profitability, or you expect to achieve profitability? So this actually, you know, what is it? You mentioned the 30 acres at 43 million. Yeah, I mean right? today, but because of the technology, and uh, in that. You know, if you're trying to, in, in our business model, we, you know, our goal from day one to, was to be a vertically integrated company. I mean, we came out of the gate doing it. But if I backtrack, I had a lot of fortunate things happen as far as the time and space. I was in a company, uh, I created a company called AgroDynamics. We were, it was a company created way back when, and uh, first ones to bring Grodan Rockwell to the United States. And I built that company based on Dutch and Danish and Scandinavian technology for greenhouse use. So after seven years of doing that, I, I got a great training. We never really made a lot of money, but survived. But I learned about all the products and the greenhouse technology uh, based on uh, the European side. And then uh, I was fortunate to have a company that was a biotechnology company. It was a NASDAQ company, and uh, I got involved in it that made biologicals uh, through their acquisition of agrodynamics. So I learned a lot about biologicals at the same time. And then when I started uh, Village Farms, which was 25 years ago, actually, this year, it was when the Dutch were shipping greenhouse tomatoes to the East Coast of the United States because of demand at that point, uh, field tomatoes, gas green tomatoes in the U.S. was probably 99% of the market. In fact, in 1983, it was less than 1% of the market was greenhouse. Today, you know, they've cannibal, uh, the greenhouse tomato, for example, has uh, taken market share north of 70%. 
So in 25 years, that's a tremendous, it's a paradigm shift. And, and really the field growers at that time didn't see it coming. They couldn't understand how somebody could spend, you know, upwards of 500,000 to a million an acre in those days and survive. But, uh, you know, because today not one field tomato grow in the United States ever migrated into the greenhouse industry. They totally missed it. But that was the opportunity that was being created by the Dutch fulfilling a need and uh, so I had a lot of opportunity to learn, and uh, we started uh, with five acres that was connected to a goat generation power plant uh, in Pennsylvania, and uh, there was a lot of help from that company in terms of capital, patience, because they actually needed the greenhouse uh, in order for their business model to work. So, you know, when you have that kind of support, it was easier, but at the same time, we started small and built this vertically integrated model but today, as we pursue local, regional, and we see that on a radar screen very clearly, uh, what we have to run into is how do we produce, our model is to produce and supply our customers 365 days a year and do it in a local environment. So, you know, if you pick a great environment to grow in where cooling's not an issue, you know, maybe the top temperature in Fahrenheit in the summer is 80 degrees, say you're building at 6,000 foot elevation outside of Denver, you have a great environment to grow in. So the capital and technology you need is, the capital is much less than the technology. But we built this recent project in uh, the Permian Basin, Texas. So last year we had 105 consecutive days over 100 degrees temperature. We had 20 days over 110 degrees and actually five days at once above 115. And we were able to maintain a 32 degree differential in the greenhouse. So, and the greenhouse is actually, it's a negative bar pressure. So it's a very, you know, talk about, it's almost a biosphere because we've controlled the environment to that degree, but the outside temperature is extreme. It's actually a more difficult environment to grow in than Saudi Arabia because the humidity levels uh, will be higher. So to get that technology to produce in a state where you have extreme climate takes a lot of capital costs. So that comes back to one of your questions. How do you do it? You either pick an environment that's good to grow the crop in and ship it, but that's not what the market wants today, or you use technology uh, to accomplish it. Um, and uh, that's why, you know, when, uh, when the earlier model was up of shipping from, you know, California to New York, I mean, that's five days. It's because you're growing in the San Joaquin Valley. It's great climate, and you ship it. And what we're trying to do is use controlled environment to grow locally, but it's, it, it takes a lot of technology and ultimately takes a lot of capital. Let's stick with this topic a little bit more. Um, I, I used to say that growing uh, – that the only way to control climate change was in a greenhouse. Um, but sometimes climate change can physically impact the greenhouse, like what happened with you in Texas uh, with a hailstorm devastating blow. Um, and so i like to just sort of use this as a segue to talk about sort of some of the, the, the challenges that come with running a farm business. Um, some of the things are out of our control. Um, like maybe Matt, you, you have a bulletproof roof on your, in your structure. So let, maybe you start off. And some of the challenges that come with operating a business. Um, I think we're, most of the challenges that we have right now um, are sort of uh, self-inflicted, if you will. Um, unlike many folks, we didn't acquire technology from somebody else and figure out how to, how to be proficient at using it or mastering it even. Um, we decided to invent all of our own technology and operate it. Um, so we're like three companies in one. We basically are, do the R&D of the technology, we manufacture it, and then we operate it. So it's really challenging to have three businesses in one um, and uh, to keep those two sort of humming together. Um, so th that's most of what we spend the time on, having basically steel boxes as our growing environment eliminates concerns of hail and weather and pretty much everything else. Um, we're, we're working on a, a project in, in Hong Kong where our, our first uh, question now is how to deal with the super typhoons um, because of the, the wind load that our, our uh, container farms create. So that's, that's going to be a new one. Um, 
but we we don't generally find the weather's much of an issue. Our our second farm in Dubai, for example, has really hot weather outside, and people thought we were crazy to put metal boxes in the desert. But you know, it's not it's really not an issue. Uh, so I mean, I think for us, it's all about you know how to um, scale the operation, how to keep uh, all the people um, sort of solving the needs of the organization, as opposed to weather and climate issues that normal farmers have to deal with. I mean, if, if this can just be a complaining session about problems, um, you know, I could probably spend two or three hours up here just telling you all of the issues you're going to have, okay? So a lot of people think that getting into this type of growing, um, somehow it's not farming anymore, and somehow you're not subject to Mother Nature, somehow you're not, you know, subject to human error and chemical imbalances and all sorts of, all the different screw-ups that can happen in a greenhouse, um, in a greenhouse business, um, just on the growing end. Not even, you know, the business side of things, you know, forgetting to pay your taxes tonight, I need to go pay payroll taxes. Um, you know, that kind of thing. That becomes a really, uh, really important part um, of the business. So, I mean, realistically speaking, the, the problems are too many to mention. But it, it's still farming. You know, it's, it's problem solving. It's working through a lot of the issues. Um, for us, most of our error is, is things like human error. You know, you can get over that with a certain amount of training. But there's always going to be some dummy who comes in late one night, you know, myself included, and turns the wrong valve or, uh, you know, doesn't answer his phone when the greenhouse calls him up, you know, because there's some things way out of whack. Um, these are just, these are all the common problems. You've got to juggle it with managing accounts and managing suppliers. You got to juggle it with all of the other stuff that comes on the business side of things. So um, that is way too big of a question for me to even begin to address. If you have any questions, you want to hear me complain for about three hours, I'll chat with you after this, and I'll talk your ear off. Maybe one example of the worst thing that happened in the last three months, maybe. In the last three months, let's see um, what's what's been some of our emergencies. So um, we're we're masochists. All right, so we're aquaponic farmers as well as hydroponic farmers, and I'll tell you, um, that's just asking. You're doubling your chance of a big problem happening with aquaponics. So anyone who's done aquaponics knows what a nightmare it can be at times. Um, I came in and turned the wrong valve not too long ago, and um, my heating system kept running, and I cooked my fish. I came in the next morning to about, you know, a thousand gallons of fish soup. Um, so, I mean, the system, I recovered. People like fish soup. So. Well, not this kind of fish soup. This is not the kind of fish soup you want to be eating. So, compost, composted about 300 pounds of fish, and, and uh, you know, that's life. So, you just, you roll with the punches, and uh, um, I think just part of farming is learning a certain level of resiliency and learning not to go insane every time something bad happens. It's picking yourself up, dusting yourself off, and keeping on plugging away well, I couldn't imagine doing both God would my but I, I often say you know if, if you don't have a problem you will just wait one minute and that's about uh, how it goes I can't even remember a day without having a problem in fact I've often used the story that if uh, a bunch of retired guys were sitting around a Starbucks and uh, they had a bit of money that they saved in their life and wanted to start a business and one guy said, well, let's, let's start a business and let's try to make it the hardest business possible. And one would say, well, let's grow a perishable product. So the moment we harvest it, you know, the clock's ticking before we have to throw it away. And why don't we have the biological, like the plant, producing our output? This way, you know, it's susceptible to disease and insect pressures and everything else. And then let's produce it in a market risk environment. So we put, you know, it's a fixed cost business, what we do in farming. And we'll put all the costs in, but not knowing what the price we're going to get for the product. It may be under the cost. And you can go on and on and then say, you know, that that's really what we're doing here. Because at the end of the day, it's still farming. And uh, But for us, uh, it's a great example of you never know what tomorrow is going to bring. Uh, two points I'll bring up. One is... Uh, uh, We've had travelers, and so we have uh, about two. Our replacement costs of our greenhouses today are, are north of three hundred million dollars. So we carry huge uh, insurance policies, and we've had travelers for twenty years, never had a claim, 
and in May 30th of 2012, in fact, back in 11, had a meeting with travelers, and they were commending us that uh, where 120-acre footprint is in, in West Texas, Southwest Texas, uh, congratulating us for building there from an insurance perspective, because it was the third safest county for weather events in the continental United States historically. And the following year, uh, never a hurricane, never a tornado, nothing. The following year, a seven-minute hail storm came over the greenhouse, and it was literally basketball-sized hail, and it wiped out 82 acres. And it wound up being a $49.5 million claim with travelers, which was the biggest claim in 2012, which led to all kinds of issues with our banks who wanted the checks and so on. So, you know, you just never know. And even again, in controlled environment, as you know, compared to field, and I would never want to be a field grower, we control so much, but it just goes to show you don't control everything. But for us, you know, we've had to find it's taken us a long time to have excellence in every execution of the disciplines we do. And uh, like Matt says, you know, his company does a bunch of different things, and we do too technology, we build the asset, we own it. Then we grow the product, we harvest it, we pack it for the end user, and then all the fulfillment, sales, marketing, distribution. So no matter how good you are in hitting the yield uh, profile to be profitable, you have to have the right cost. And they have to have the right input cost. And uh, then you have to have the right quality spec. And every one of our customers has a different color spec, different quality spec. And then even shipping it, you know, we have 20 minute slot times that we have to meet. So you can grow the best product in the world. If it doesn't get to the distribution center of your customer in, in a 20 minute slot time and you miss it, you just screwed up. So every day working all those disciplines to execute, you know, is, is tough to do. But every business has its issues. But um, that's how I. Operational execution is huge, huge, huge issue, especially when you transition from, you know, being the founders who, you know, live and breathe it to having employees do it. You know, you don't even realize what they don't know that you have to train them on and make sure that they're complying on um, that, you know, you just did instinctively or you, you just thought it was the right way to go. Suddenly now there has to be documentation, operation managers, training, you know, what do you do for discipline if they don't follow the procedures? You know, it's just, it's immense um, to just move away from being the guy who cares to the employee who's getting a, a paycheck. And I mean, I mean, I think our, like our biggest brain dead move here recently was um, we got a, a new SKU introduced to the grocery store. We were so excited. This is the big deal to us. We, you know, they, the orders were going to double our revenue this was for that grocery store this was an amazing uh, milestone for the company and then we printed the wrong UPC on the label um, they were not they were let's just say not happy with us <laughs> well, you had mentioned compliance and um, I think about um, segueing into food safety and gap certification and uh, I think the first hydro, no, the first aquaponic farm is now getting uh, GAP certified in the U.S. They're based in Indiana, if I understand that correctly. And hydroponic farms more increasingly becoming um, GAP certified. I know Village Farms was certified for a while. Um, I understand how you do it on a large scale, but how do you manage to become wholesale distributor on a, lar on a smaller scale and justify the cost of GAP certification, if anybody wants to take that? Well, I'll, I'll jump in. Um because we went through the pains of, of becoming certified. Uh, we, today, we actually follow the GFSI uh, food safety standard, uh, and we're um, third-party audited by Primus GFS. Um, so that's pretty substantial commitment in terms of uh, operations uh, cost. Um, but the big issue seems to be one of do you want food safety um, to sort of come up and force you to respond to it, or do you want to be proactive and get ahead of food safety before it happens? And you don't want to be the guy who's got a new farm that's doing everything right, and then uh, you ship bad product and kill somebody. Your, your business is over at that point. Um, so you definitely don't want that. Further, you know, at least 
there's a lot of unregulated parts of this business that are about to be pretty regulated with the Food Safety Modernization Act, and certainly a lot of the big distributors uh, require third-party third audits now. Most of the grocery stores uh, do. So, you know, food safety is one of these things where you got to get ahead of it. And as far as I can tell, there's, there's no cheap way to do it. I, I, if somebody knows a cheap way to do it, please tell me. But uh, I, I can't find a cheap way to do it. Um, and so I think that's going to be a really big problem for, for small farmers because, you know, what we found is last year our food safety cost is the same as this year, but we've grown the business enormously. And so if you look at that as a percentage of, of our cost, obviously the bigger we get, the smaller our food safety cost is as a percentage. And that's just not kind of fair to, to smaller operations. So, um, you know, I, I don't think people are addressing that issue. I think we all want everybody to be safe and we want the regulations and everything so that we as consumers can feel good about our products. But, you know, I think it's also good to have the ability for small farmers to exist. Yeah, cert certifications are a rough one. And um, there's something that we address really regularly with our farmers. And... Um, it, it's one of those things where uh, a lot of the time it's based on the markets that you're selling into. So, I mean, uh, you know, for us, if one of our farmers wants to get started with Whole Foods, they need certifications. Um, so it, it's kind of one of those things where, uh, you know, depending on who the um, who, who's buying your product, that will dictate, you know, what kind of certifications you have to have. Regardless of whether or not you are certified, you should be following um, all of the food safety regulations, you should be implementing best practices all of the time, and you should be doing the research on, on you know, food handling and safety. Um, so, I mean, it, it's kind of one of those things. Uh, some of our farms, you just got to buckle down and do it. Um, it gives you access to markets that uh, you wouldn't have otherwise accessed. So then the trick then is just to take a high enough margin that you can justify the cost of the certifications, right? So... Um, it's a decision that you can make in Excel. You can shop around uh, with different certifiers to kind of figure out, you know, how you can do it the most cost-effective way. But the reality is you're going to spend money on it. There's, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. You're going to spend money on it. So then the, the question there is just, you know, what's the payoff? And uh, do I think it's worth it? So, you know, a lot, of, a lot of our farmers, you know, if they're selling to restaurants, they're selling at farmer's markets. If they're selling on a relatively small scale to small accounts, um, it's less important that they have actual certifications to them. Now, you know, we tell them they always have to have insurance. They always have to be following those rules. But, you know, it, it varies from state to state uh, what's required. Um, so it's kind of a market research question. Of course, if everyone in the world could be certified, that would be great. Um, but and, and we're transitioning towards it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's one of those issues where for a small farmer, there is kind of, um, going back to your size of the farm kind of question, there's kind of a minimum size that you need to have. There's, there's a certain amount of mass that you need to have to uh, be able to actually enter the market and deliver produce on a reliable uh, level. So, you know, as far as that goes, certification plays into that because, you know, like you said, the larger you get, the cheaper it becomes, right? The cheaper it becomes. Um, so as a small farmer, you just you need to do the math uh, and you need to figure out uh, what's kind of what what that threshold is where you can afford to do that and what kind of marks at additional markets it's going to give you access to if you do um, but restating you should be following you should be using best practices no matter what no matter what um, food safety is very important so Michael, I know, I know you've been innovating in this space, and I, I know you could talk about a lot of work you've done, but I want to take you to a different question, if that's okay. Um, I, uh, you know, being a, a major supplier of tomatoes in North America, um, and, um, like, for example, like Walmart coming in saying they want to be the low price leader in organics in the U.S., like, um, and there's just not, clearly not enough organic tomatoes in the, in the U.S. to meet the demand they could possibly supply. Uh, how do you reconcile the, um, and this is playing into the question, really, it's maybe more a, a policy question about, about NAFTA and dealing with the cost of cheap imports over from across the border. How do, you, how do you launch a business today at the scale that you are um, when you're competing with 
probably a, a somewhat unregulated source of food across the border um, while also meeting, and, and when the end user doesn't even know necessarily the difference between two identically hydroponically grown tomatoes. So how do you tackle that? Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure how you launched that business today, but I can tell you that, uh, you know, I'm a proponent of uh, fair trade. You know, not just uh, free trade. It has to be fair. And uh, I think it's changing. I think what's happening is, well, look, Costco is one of our, we supply Costco. So Costco, five years ago, took the bold view of saying that all their products within the greenhouse category will be only greenhouse, not field. So that is uh, peppers, cucumbers. We supply them those tomatoes and all the varieties. And then they came out two years ago and they said their goal is that all their product that's producing greenhouses, uh, their mandate is that it's U.S. or Canadian grown. So they've already made that statement. And uh, I was just at a Costco. Every year they have a vendor meeting for their top 100 produce vendors. That was actually last Thursday, Friday in Seattle. And the head of all their food division, uh, and he says the same thing each year, his number one concern is food safety, and he can't sleep at night thinking where our product's coming from as far as Central America or Mexico. So I think the move to uh, local regional, is, uh, as it's viewed by uh, retailers, also couples with uh, the underlying thing that they're concerned about food safety and where the product's grown. And I won't talk about food safety, but just to give you an idea with Walmart uh, and uh, traceability. I mean, we have to, in order to sell Walmart, and they're one of our largest accounts. And by the way, they're a great account. You know, uh, we, we recognized early on that there's two mistakes you can make, and one is selling Walmart and one's not selling them. So, uh, but they're a great account, and actually, believe it or not, they have the highest specification that we need to meet every day of all the retailers that we sell. We sell all the big box retailers and all other retailers nationally, the highest specification that we need to meet. So that some, says something about it. But traceability, we have to be able to trace back a product within two hours. So if they call us at 10 in the morning by noon, we have to tell them what greenhouse it came from, what row, and that includes product, because we do represent, uh, we also market for other growers, and uh, we have an operation in the Dominican Republic. So that program, and I'm sure it's not for smaller vendors, but that was about a million-dollar investment in our IT systems to be able to do that. It took about two years to get there, but that kind of rides on what Matt's saying. It's just going to get tougher to do. Um, but as far as uh, competing, we are competing. In fact, uh, we, uh, we've launched the U.S. I was involved in 1999 uh, as one of three greenhouse growers. In that time, we aligned ourselves with field growers and sued Canada over a dumping lawsuit and basically won that lawsuit. And uh, two years ago, we went against Mexico the same way because they are dumping. And dumping is basically if you're importing into the United States, selling under your cost of production, it's against the law, and they were doing that. And... Uh, uh, we settled it through a revised uh, uh, suspension agreement that was an ongoing agreement that had existed. But the point is, we went to Commerce, and they supported us. And in fact, we're issuing a press release on our first quarter. We're a public company tonight. And in that press release, my comments talk about circumvention by Mexico of that agreement, which is only a year old. So, you know, they'll... Countries will continue to do what they have to do to get their produ product in the U.S. market. But I think uh, that's all the oppor that's great opportunity. We see that as phenomenal opportunity in the future, and I think what will happen is uh, for all the things that were mentioned so far this morning, uh, food safety will drive increased production in the U.S. Let me just add to, to that. Um, if you are considering um, starting a food safety program, Think about traceability as part of your food safety and implement it at the same time. You'll save yourself a lot of headache, a lot of money. Um, there's a website, pro, uh, producetraceability.org, uh, um, or I think it's initiative.org. Uh, but basically, the people are looking for PTI compliance. That website has the information on how to do that. Walmart was the first uh, grocery store to require PTI compliance. That started as of January 
uh, this year. Um, but increasingly, the other grocery stores are adopting that. Um, and, uh, you know, if you can fit that in with your food safety, I think you'll find that together those two things are, are – they are expensive and time-consuming to implement. But if you do them separate, they will be twice as expensive and time-consuming to implement. The other thing to consider is, first of all, I think you, you have to be responsible. You're producing a product that people ingest into their body. So I think uh, it would be wrong not to have the passion behind uh, producing something that's safe. We did it early on, long before we had to, because we believe that we had a responsibility to make sure our food is safe. Secondly, it will differentiate you from others. And then third, with the capital that's going into these operations and getting financing, you really need to have a food safety program. There's no doubt about it, or it's not going to be a sustainable business model going forward. I, again, sorry to just add one more. I mean, we have seen when we've been raising capital, investors who come and, you know, they've seen a lot of businesses in this space. And when they see our food safety program and our product traceability program, and how that relates to the grocery stores, they realize that, you know, we're a, you know, a different investment that we're, you know, taking the market seriously. And, you know, it's not something that you guys can't do yourselves. Um, there, you can implement a lot of this yourself. A lot of the, uh, even the big distributors out there like Cisco puts on free workshops on food safety. You can learn a lot about food safety just by going to their free workshops. Um, and I believe the uh, USDA even offers help with uh, GAP certification. I think they even have uh, the ability to uh, provide you a, for a, a relatively low fee, a GAP certification. So there's resources out there to help you if you're willing to take on the time. If you're not willing to take on the time and you have the money, there's a lot of consultants who will do it for you. Well, I started off with a list of questions. It's only doubled since I started talking with you guys. But I wonder if I could open up to you, the general audience, about any burning questions. We have a few minutes. If anybody wants to jump up. Back here. Yes, you in the green hat. Uh, I, I absolutely. I don't mean to imply pessimism at all. Uh, I'm trying to be realistic on challenges that exist and that you need to solve. Um, but I'm optimistic. They are solvable. We've solved them. You can solve them. There's a lot of resources out there to do it. This format is difficult for us to provide you a lot of information. Um, but you know, I'll be around in this conference for the next uh, day or two. Um, I'm certainly happy to answer questions. I think that. You know, local is the new model. I know some people don't think necessarily that field growing is going to go away. I'm not saying it's going to go either uh, away either. But I believe in indoor agriculture. I believe that we can do uh, distributed growth of food as opposed to centralized growth of food. And I think that um, the more of us that are successful, the better all of us will be. And I'm happy to share whatever uh, we've learned through the School of Hard Knocks to help make you successful because if grocery stores only want to buy local, that's going to make my business better. Here in front. Yes, yes you here. Oh, did you have a question? Yes. You bet. So um, depending on where you're at, because different states have different requirements and, um, and uh, different certifiers, I mean, they, they're all following roughly kind of the same rules, but um, 
Yeah, I, I would say depending on where you're at, I mean, your local, um, you know, university extension office, the USDA, and, of course, your county health and safety folks will all have um, input on that stuff um, from a certifying perspective. And um, then, of course, depending on what markets, what markets you're selling into, certain organizations have certain requirements of you, too. So um, one thing that we've kind of started to do is we've started to compile this packet um, that, that we're developing for our farmers, you know, as, as they get started. Because it, it can be, for a single person, you know, one of the benefits of being a part of a larger organization is that you can assign, you know, three people or, or hire a consultant um, to bring you up to date on everything you need to be doing, on all the compliance issues, on all the requirements. And uh, that's easy, right, because it's a synopsis. You can just do steps one, two, three, four, five uh, through 100. <laughs> but, um, you know, as, as one person, that research can be really daunting. So um, as far as I know, there isn't a really good kind of compiled database of this is what you do. Uh, but this is kind of something like we're working on this within our organization. And we've had other farmers who have just gone out and done the research and um, had really good results there. So, so you were uh, yes. Anybody's interested in uh, GAP certification specifically for aquaponics, I can connect you to the people who are doing that now through the Aquaponic Association, so see me. Thanks. Uh, final question. Here you go. You were first. Right, you know, along those lines, I, I, um, I mean, I can't speak for the other organizations up here, but um, my organization is, we try to be really open with um, our information. However, I will say it's not a core business. You know, at the end of the month, I need to make payroll. And, um, you know, so as far as how that information is released, um, you know, like we, we are not proactive about going out and building a database, a searchable database, that kind of thing, because, um, you know, we're just, we're just cranking along, um, attending to our core business. So, you know, as far as that goes, I mean, um, there are lots of great, uh, like, I, I do a lot of webinars and that kind of thing on that kind of stuff, so check check those out. Because, um, you know, we, we try to be open with the information. We feel like it's necessary for the growth of the industry, especially because, you know, not everyone trying to get into indoor growing right now is a 10-person um, or 20-person or 30-person organization. We're talking usually individuals or a couple of, of folks that want to go into business together. So, um, you know, I, I would say, too, don't be afraid to ask for information. Um, I think you'll find that the people that are already kind of established in this industry are very open about sharing um, what they've learned and sharing sharing their information, numbers, that kind of thing. He has a YouTube page with 100,000 views sharing tons of information. So We cracked a million the other day. So. A million, excuse me. I've lost a zero. Sorry. Which, you know, I know is not a big deal for some channels, but when you're talking about really nerdy farming stuff, um, it we, feels a little good. Aren't we all trying to be nerds here? So, so uh, just to add to that, I'm, I'm happy to share as much information as I can. The, the main document that you need is your food safety plan. 
and all of the, your standard operating procedures. I can't give that to you for a lot of reasons, the most important of which is that it won't apply to you. You have to create your own plan and your own standard operating procedures. Somebody can tell you that you need all that and what kind of procedures you need, but you still have to write it down. Um, so that's the big thing. There's, there's uh, I mean, Primus, you can go to Primus's website and download uh, a template that you can just start editing uh, yourself. Um, that might not be right, but you know, it'd be better than getting our food safety plan that wouldn't apply to you. So as much as we can help, we're happy to help. It just, it's, I don't think it's gonna be one of those things where you can put up a document on a wiki and everybody could just download it and say, hey, I don't have to buy a, a food safety plan anymore. It's not gonna work like that. But I'll, one other thing I'll add is that if you're doing indoor ag, like control environment, food safety is much easier. If, if you're not using pesticides and you're using municipal water, um, your life got a lot easier. If you're, if you're in the field or using the well and you've got pesticides, you're in big trouble. Speaking of food, I think we reached that point where we get to partake in that period where we get to consume food. Thank you.